are you? My name's Bond. James Bond. Bond. James Bond. Bond, what do you think you're doing? Keeping the British hand up, sir. Welcome to James Bond Radio. News, reviews, and discussion of all things 007. As you can see, I have no problem with female authority. Oh, pipe down, 007. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. Hello, welcome to James Bond Radio. This is podcast number 19, and this is our interview with Matthew Parker, the author of GoldenEye. I've got my good buddy Tom Sears with me right here. Say hi, Tom. Hello, mate. How's it going? Not too bad, sir. Not too bad. How are you doing your end? Yeah, not so bad, mate. Not so bad. I'm excited about this interview today. Yeah, it's uh, I, it was a good time. It was a good, like we didn't know a huge amount about the book, did we? Beforehand, we kind of knew it was it, was, it wasn't fiction. It, you know, it's it's sort of fact. And uh, Matthew is a bit of a historian, um, but getting a lot of detail on Ian Fleming and Jamaica and Goldeneye, it was uh, yeah, it's good. Yeah, so so to clear it up for any confused listeners, this isn't Goldeneye, is in the John Gardner novelization of the film. This is no. a book about Ian Fleming's uh, kind of villa and his life in Jamaica and, and what it was like at the time. So it's like a historical document, I guess you would call it, yeah. um, all about that place and, and that time, which is quite quite cool and interesting. Yeah, hopefully the audience will like it. <laughs> yeah, completely. So uh, before we crack on, uh, come and join us on Facebook, which is uh, if you just put James Bond Radio into the Facebook search. Uh, same on Twitter, at, at James Bond Radio. Come and follow us. Um, and something that's really handy for us is if you can leave us a glowing five-star review on iTunes, that would be absolutely lovely because that helps us rank higher and we get more listeners and the whole James Bond Radio family grows. Um, which we love. Which we love indeed. Um, and uh, and also come and leave us a voicemail on SpeakPipe, which if you go to our website, jamesbondradio.com, there's a little button on the right-hand side that says leave us a voicemail um, <laughs> and you can just leave us a message through your computer. So if you've got any questions, anything you want us to talk about on the show, or anything you want to talk about just leave us a voicemail and maybe we'll uh, even play your message we got a we got a message from uh, a fellow called carlos in jacksonville florida this week um, and he said he he took our ultimate quiz and he only missed two questions which is way better than both you and i did on yeah. our own quiz which is pretty <laughs> mental, <isn't it? laughs> yeah uh, some good scoring there definitely ranks 007 sector there yeah yeah completely so uh, well done to carlos and mm. uh, with that said as well if you uh, if you miss us during the weeks when we're not uh, broadcasting uh, you can get a bonus episode that isn't on iTunes or, or anywhere else, uh, which is our ultimate James Bond quiz. It's another, I think it's a 90 minute or even a two hour episode. Um, and you can get access to that at jamesbondradio.com as well. So, yeah. Excellent. And with the um, voicemail as well, if anyone wants to leave a quote, we've only had one or two that have come through and we really want to get some fan quotes in there because there must be so many good quotes out there that haven't been done. And whoever sends one in, they're bound to be better than Tom and I. Uh, sort of small. <laughs> well, maybe, Speak maybe, for yourself, mate. Yeah, no, no, okay, better than me, but, you know. So it would be great if you could get a few quotes in as well, and then obviously we'll play them and uh, and we'll have a go at guessing them ourselves. So, yeah, that'd yeah, be great. Absolutely. So we reached a bit of a milestone last week, didn't we? We, we reached 20,000 downloads of the podcast, which is uh, which is pretty huge. Huger than we dreamed it would ever get to anyway, wasn't it? Eh? Definitely. Well, I celebrated with a bottle of Bolin Girardi. What did you do? I, uh, I just... I can't think of anything funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny as it is. <laughs> so there we go. <laughs> I, I just smiled at myself. You just That's, smiled. Yeah. That's, it. That's good. A yeah. smile is good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, oh, the other thing as well, the the uh, we did a little um, snippet of last week's episode, which was uh, the uh, the Bond songs thing all working to the same chords. Um, That's right. And uh, JBR listener Warren Ringham did a follow up video, which was cool because he's uh, he's the the band leader of uh, like the ultimate Bond tribute band, isn't he? Uh, Cue the music. Cue music. Um, so I think that's pasted on the on the Facebook page, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, if anyone hasn't had a chance yet, definitely check it out. It's on one of the messages on the Facebook page, and it's really interesting the cues it was showing through. You know, uh, about what six, seven, eight songs all having the same sort of cue. So definitely check it out. Um, yeah. it's, it's an interesting. It's interesting look. to see how they weave little bits and pieces from the Bond theme. Yeah. in the different songs and kind of yeah it's, it's clever it's it's cool i like it yeah um so what what's the what's the bond 24 news this week um well, we actually we've got quite a lot to talk about which is quite interesting um well it's kind of over the last week we heard about it um first of all that the script is apparently complete Yay. which is 
Yay! So yeah, another reason to get the champagne out. But um, you know, it's it's interesting because we just almost didn't hear anything. It sounded like it was all in turmoil. You know, you had Logan. There were rumours that it wasn't quite right. Bringing Purvis and Wade back to try and sort it out, which um, obviously seemed to be working, or it must have worked because now apparently Mendes is obviously happy with it now. Daniel Craig is obviously happy with it now. I mean, on films, no matter what sort of film you work on, once you sort of say the script is ready, even between that and filming, and sometimes during filming, it will still change yeah. because, it's, it, you know, it, obviously it will. But the fact that they're happy to sort of have a locked script, that they're, you know... Well, there's there's some interesting sort of nuggets about this in the in the sort of the press release. Again, it's um, from uh, Baz Bam, big boy, at the... Uh, <laughs> the Daily Mail, I love that name, and he's yeah. apparently been quite reliable with his his uh, sort of scoops in the past on previous Bond films and stuff. Um, and basically, uh, he wrote that the initial reports were that Purvis and Wade had come back to uh, to do some touch up work on John Logan's script, but now he's saying it's more of a of a more of a considerable rewrite. Mm. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out because, as we discussed before, isn't it? Like we've always been like Purvis and Wade, Invisible Cars. But yeah. when you actually hear them talk, you find that that wasn't them, and they they actually the, the things they served up were then changed by somebody else and made more fantastical and yeah. in, and in a lot of cases more rubbish. So mm-hmm. now the shoes on the other foot. Maybe John Logan went that way, and they've pulled it back into touch. Yeah. So hopefully do, that's what's happened. Do you know what would be absolutely amazing? Go even on. though it would never ever happen, if we could get John Logan's script in one hand. And the Purvis and Wade rewrite yeah. in the other, and just compare them. Yeah. That would be awesome, wouldn't that it? Would just to amazing. see, yeah. just to see how it changed. Well, it was like when we went to visit Silver Mason, wasn't it? And we we literally had a copy of the original we... script of Thunderball in our hands. Yeah. And like back in the days when it was Bond versus the Mafia and all that kind of stuff, yeah. and we wanted to do a reading, didn't we? We were wanted yeah. to do like a scoop, and we 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 were actually going to like try and read out the script from start to finish, but um, we realised that uh, it would be a legal minefield, and we'd probably end up with lawsuits coming out of every orifice <laughs> yeah. if we even <laughs> thought about doing that. So we we knocked that one on the head. Pretty yeah, quickly. yeah. Um, oh well, but, uh, maybe in the future if it gets released, who yeah, knows? Yeah, but but this is interesting because it says here that apparently. Mendes and Craig begged Purvis and Wade to come back and fix the script. So wow. you never know how much of this is sensationalist newspaper bollocks, but yeah. at the same time, it's it's you know it, it does make you wonder a little bit. Um, but to sort of finish it up, it says uh, everyone's excited and all systems are pumping away at full speed. The source said, adding that Purvis and Wade's script is substantially different from Logan's. Wow. There was an awful lot of work to do. It was a big job. The impression given was that Purvis and Wade were hired to add jokes, but it was a much bigger deal than that. Wow, that is quite a statement. I mean, that just makes me want to read them both even more. Yeah. But if it is a case that they're pulling back, then great, you know. Well, kudos on them for deciding to bring them in and sort it out. Yeah. So we'll see. And it, it leads to the next sort of bit of Bond news as well. Um, basically, Austria has 100% been confirmed as a location now. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, originally they were looking at Norway. So, you know, Norway, Austria, you're thinking snow, mountains and stuff like yeah. this. But apparently they pulled out of Norway and Austria is a sort of alternative. Now, they don't know whether this was due to Norway um, being expensive to shoot because a lot of countries have sort of incentives like tax incentives. If yeah. you film in their country, you get sort of money towards the production and everything. Yeah. And Norway doesn't really have one or if it does the benefit is minuscule compared to other countries i know there's a lot of tax relief and stuff in various places for filmmakers and stuff isn't it exactly yeah yeah. and norway is probably not quite as good so they don't know whether that was the main factor or whether it was the fact that perhaps um purvis and wade's rewrite changed the setting altogether i don't know but then again if you've got a mountain setting you could set it anywhere couldn't you really that's true you could set it it in wales can you chris you could set it in well yeah i'm waiting next year we'll get some snow on the beacons we'll get Bond, Bond 24 there. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so we were there in Austria, which is which is an interesting thing because I put a little message on the board saying, okay, so skiing, oh, it's not skiing. We've got a snow sequence in Austria. What, what do people think, you know? Are we going to see Daniel Craig skiing, snowboarding, snowmobiling, like in an ice yacht, ice climbing, uh, mm. you know, so many possibilities. We're going to see a bobsleigh or perhaps a skeleton, which is kind of like the updated version. Yeah. Or I, I, Like someone mentioned about skeleton, I thought... They could do a thing where if he's on a skeleton chase, I mean, I don't think it's going to happen. But then it almost launches out of the out of the 
track and then continues on down the piece. Oh, it's not going to happen, is it? But, skeleton um, is, is that one, isn't it? It's the event where they're sort of led on that tray and they're going head first, yeah, aren't they? It's almost yeah. like a bobsleigh, but a lot smaller but, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it's a bobsleigh and bobsleigh are feet first and skeleton's yeah. head first, yeah, that sort of thing. But I mean, I mean, there's so many things that, that could possibly happen, but um, I don't I, know, what, what's your opinion? Well, on I suppose the, the ski thing is, is still speculation, isn't it? We don't know for a yeah. fact that it's going to be Austria because of snow. We? No, I, well, if it was going to be Norway and then they chose Austria, I think snow. Yeah, you know, and, and I think you mentioned before that Mendes went on a skiing holiday. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think snow is a safe bet. Yeah. I don't want to say one hundred percent, but I think it's a pretty safe bet yeah. because I think they mentioned the Austrian Alps as well. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, are we going to get another cello? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Could be part two. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that unfolds. Because again, I, I think where they might be going with this is now like the whole rebooting process is done at, with the end of Skyfall. You know, we've got a male M again and, and all that kind of stuff. I do wonder whether they're going to be looking at bringing in a lot more traditional elements to Bond. Like, yeah. you know, either ski sequences, the, you know, underwater scuba stuff that sort of, you know, that are sprinkled yeah. throughout Bond. So I wonder whether, like, I wonder how they're going to approach that and make it different to what's been before, you know, and, and yeah. instead of just having some random skiing. But um, do you know what, though? I know I've said this before, but I really struggle to f- see Danny Boy in a yellow jumpsuit yeah. skiing down the red, a yellow <laughs> jumpsuit with a red backpack and woolly hat on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, he would be in something else, but Pierce kind of, you know, he, he seemed all right skiing, obviously, George, what have you. I don't know, just I see Danny Boy more as a, like snowmobile or something. Well, thinking about know. it, maybe it isn't skiing. Remember when yeah. with, uh, our chat with Raymond Benson and he was saying about High Time to Kill, how they'd never been a climbing Bond film? Yeah, like an ice climbing, yeah. maybe like an, on a big ice, frozen waterfall yeah, or something. Maybe. So ice climbing to get to a resort. Because that, interestingly enough, that was part of the original screenplay for Tomorrow Never Dies. You know how it begins the pre title sequence where Bond's just looking That's at the arms. Right. Originally, yeah. it opened with him climbing up a frozen um, waterfall with axes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, and we know they like to recycle things that they previously meant to use and didn't. So maybe yeah. we've knocked onto something there. That maybe. would be interesting. Yeah. And that's good because obviously we've seen climbing, you know, in uh, Fiora is only when he's climbing up yeah. in mountain in Greece. But having a nice climb, that's good. I like yeah. that. Ooh, interesting i'm claiming that one if that yeah. one comes in i'm getting all the kudos for that <laughs> right, definitely right. <laughs> um so the only other news uh so far there's another swedish actress that's been put forward as a potential for the uh female role uh nice. the swedish uh, the scandinavian role sorry who is isabel edvardson never heard anything about her all i know is apparently she's a professional dancer but there we are there you go. um nice. and that was about it for bond before news yeah. okay cool stuff so uh let's uh, before we crack on with the interview then let's uh let's do our trivia round so do you want to go first i think i will okay. i think i'll go first and this one i think that you'll like but right, okay cool. so we're talking about um uh obviously we've got the interview it's about uh jamaica and that sort of area so my question is in how many are the James Bond Ian Fleming novels a set in Jamaica? Oh, I think I can do this one. Let me just have a little think. I know one, two, three. Yeah, I think. Okay, I've, I've got a good shot at that one, I think. Yeah, I thought you'd yeah, 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 yeah. on. Okay. You're good, good with the books. Um, okay, and my question is inspired, actually, by one of our listeners who emailed in. Wow. Um, and he uh, basically uh, su- suggested a fact, and I thought, hang about, that's not quite right. Um, so my, I, I, if it's caught <laughs> him out, it might catch other people out too. So um, that was an email from Alexis Palazzolo. Sorry if I've... Uh, pronounce that wrong alexis but uh yeah what can you do um so the question is how many times does bond actually say 007 in the whole series wow now alexis said it only happened once but i can think of more okay okay that's one that's definitely thinking caps on it certainly is okay yeah okay so have a good think about that excellent so it's interview time so you you took the reins on this one uh, on your own you did a one-to-one uh uh, interview rather than our usual threesome. 
Yes, I use your three sim. Unfortunately, it was only a, a menage a deux. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. Like, I mean, we've been quite lucky. Everyone that we've interviewed has been sort of really nice. I'm waiting for someone to interview who turned out to be a right. But luckily, we haven't had that yet. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. Let's keep, keep them coming like that, I think. Let's keep them coming. Okay, yeah. so uh, let's, uh, let's cut to the interview. This is uh, James from Radio's interview with author Matthew Parker. Welcome, Matthew Parker, author of Golden Eye for James from Radio Interview. It's good to have you on board. Hello, Chris. Thanks for getting me on. Really appreciate it. No, that's not, not at all. It's our pleasure. So we've had a little look at the actual book itself, and obviously it's about Golden Eye, where um, Ian Fleming used to go, uh, his house in Jamaica, where he used to write the Bond novels. And so this is a fi- – um, it's not a fiction book. This is sort of a factual book about Fleming and about Jamaica. Is that right? That's right, yeah. It's a biography of Fleming – in Jamaica. Okay. And the important Jamaica for his, for his books. Brilliant. Okay, that sounds good. It's, a, it's nice to, because that's kind of a side of um, things that people wouldn't either think about or at least it hasn't been referenced much. So it's really nice to get that sort of different angle because you have so many books about Bond, you know, best film, best this, best that and best the other, which is fine. But to see something from a slight, you know, from a different angle, I think that's great. So... Excellent. Sounds good. Looking forward to it. <laughs> okay, so um, we'll start off with a bit of a quick fire round, which we do with all of our guests. So it doesn't have to be super quick, um, but we'll see how we see how you get on. So, okay, Matthew Parker, question number one: What is your favourite Bond film? Okay, I've been thinking about this, Chris, and I've been asking my my family. Um, <laughs> And we've come up with five different films. But my one I'm going to go with is The Living Daylights. Wow, okay, The Living Daylights. Brilliant film. I think the pre-title sequence is probably one of my favourites in the series. But what, awesome. what sort of makes it the best for you? Um, I really like Timothy Dalton. I thought he, he was a really fresh take on the role. Um, as you said, that opening sequence in Gibraltar, part of the Empire. Of course, Bond is an imperial hero. Uh, I always was in the books, and so he, he should be in the films. Uh, Marianne Darbo is awesome. Yeah. And um, there's, I love the character as well, the, the Taliban. It's Art Malik who plays this, this um, what we would now call Taliban, but then was the, the, the sort of good guy. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and who's been in Oxford. And it's just, it's so Fleming. It's so Fleming. He would have loved that film. Yeah. Living Daylights is definitely a good shout. For me, it's it's right up there. Um, funnily enough, I'm not sure if you're aware, but Tom went to a Living Daylights event at Pinewood a couple of weeks ago. So I saw that. I saw about that, talking about that, yeah. That's right. So he's got pictures of him with Miriam Diabo and Jerome Cuebe and... Uh, I am very jealous. I am very jealous. In, and he had a really nice picture of him with the two double O's from the pre-title sequence, and you can recognise them. And straight away, you know, the scene is played, uh-huh. and you're just like, "Oh my god, that's so good! <laughs> it's brilliant." Well, ask him to get Miriam Lovers to come to my launch party. Oh yeah, there we go. I'll, I'll, I'm that'd, sure. That'd be brilliant. That'd yeah, be brilliant. we'll put in the the text and see what we can do. <laughs> so, I, um, w- w- um, this will be an interesting one, actually. Question number two: What is your favourite Bond book? Okay, um, this is a toss-up between two. Okay, both of which I think I think well, one of the things that Fleming took from all that time in Jamaica was he loved the reef. He loved going snorkeling and diving. It was just his favourite thing in the entire world. And I think, and I'm not alone in thinking, but as a writer, he's at his very, very best describing underwater underwater battles and so on. Um, now, that, it may sound like I'm going to say Thunderball, and that's the really, really close second, but I have to go for Live and Let Die. Uh, I haven't read Live and Let Die for a little while, but I remember it, the description when he was underwater and the sharks and when he was going towards the island, Mr. Big's Island. It was, you know, it was so vivid and, and it just put you there. And of course, there's that scene at the end, which is um, described to me. I, I was talking to Sebastian Folks about, about his experience of writing a, a Bond novel. And I was sort of saying, you know, what did you think? Because he's this really literary novelist. And I said, what do you think? And he said, that scene in Live and Let Die, when Solitaire and James are tied together, and it's, a, it's an old pirate trick, 
it's an old Henry Morgan ship careening, you know, pulling yes. people behind the boat. Yeah. And when they're rattling towards the reef, that is described by Stassian folks as thriller writing of the very, very highest class. Wow. Uh, and there's lots of that. There's lots of that great writing in Live and Let Die. It's drag, the plot drags you on. Uh, the short chapters with sort of hanging bits at the, at the end. And then, of course, this wonderful in the middle, and he's in jeopardy the whole time. He's basically, you know, it's always, the baddies always know where he is. Yeah. Apart from one bit right in the middle of the book where there's this wonderful sort of a, a, a oasis of peace when him and Coral go to Negril Beach for yeah. his sort of training and his sort of like detox and so on, um, where, he, where he just, lo- and the, the love of Jamaica that is infuses that book as well, I think is absolutely present. Excellent. Well, um, I'll have to have it, give it another read pretty soon, I think. It sounds good. Um, so this will be an interesting one as well. Question number three, who is your favourite Bond actor? Although I might have a guess from what you've said earlier on. Um, no, no, you'd be wrong. I've, oh. I've got two favourite actors, both of whom had incredibly minor parts in Dog to know. Okay. Um, one is Marguerite Loise, um, who's now Marguerite Gordon, um, who plays the photographer um, employed by Dr. No to, to take pictures. That's right. Um, now, the reason, the reason why I like her so much is that I've, I've spoken to her on the phone and I've interviewed her for the book, and she is an utterly, utterly delightful woman. Mm-hmm. And looking at pictures, but you know that she was Miss Jamaica in 1961, and she won mm-hmm. a prize of Ford Anglia car, which made her very happy. Wow. And, and she was recruited by Terence Young from the, from the air, she was working in the airline on the counter, and she was recruited by Terence Young to, to be in the film. The other one is um, Timothy Moxon, who played Strangways. Yes, yeah. The first person to die in any Bond film. Um, and he sadly died a few years ago. Um, but I've been in touch with his daughter, who's Jamaican, lives in Jamaica. Mm. And she gave me an unpublished memoir that he'd written, which has got lots and lots of stuff about being in Jamaica at the time, being in Dr. No, going along to the Court Hode Hotel to, to pitch his, himself to Terence Young. Wow. Uh, Fascinating things that Terence Young says about Sean Connery, and and also he was he lived in Orocabesta, which is the village where Goldeneye is sort of next to, yeah. and knew Fleming socially. So he went around to Goldeneye, and uh, and he's very interesting talking about Fleming and that yeah. in, in the late sixties, in the early sixties at that time in his life. Yeah. Uh, he's also just comes across as such a nice man. Mm. Um, so so ra- two rather obscure characters get my uh, yeah. get my vote. Third would have to be Grace Jones. Because um, she, through this book, I met her through Chris Blackwell, you know, who now owns yes, Golden yeah. he runs it as a hotel. Uh, and she's obviously a big protege of his. Uh, and I met her a couple of months ago, and she's exactly the same yeah. as she was when she was on that poster on my wall when I was a teenager. Yeah. She's exactly the same. And utterly charming and delightful as well. Lovely lady. Wow. I haven't had the pleasure of meeting Grace Jones, but I wouldn't. I definitely wouldn't mind one day. That's that sounds like quite an opportunity there. Well, I, I was supposed to play tennis with her. Oh, really? So, uh, <laughs> the next time I want to play tennis with her. Well, yeah. That would be so cool. <laughs> um, so, do you have a favourite actor to who has portrayed Bond? Um, I think they're all they're all different. I think you have to you have to give the nod to Sir Sean. Bourne. He yeah. really created that role uh, to such. A, to an extent that um, Fleming actually, ch- Fleming in the books, subsequent to Sean's first performance, he actually started changing Bond to make him more like Sean Corey. For a start, yeah. he suddenly becomes Scottish. Yes, he wasn't yeah. Scottish before, no, but then that's suddenly true. we learn in his obituary in, in, that he's half Scottish. Yeah. And I think in the, the Man with the Golden Gun, he turns down a, a knighthood because he wants to stay a Scottish peasant. <laughs> so suddenly he's become Sean Connery. Yeah. And he's certainly no, he's not a Scottish peasant. For 1962, at all, he's a home county story. Yeah, it's it's an interesting transformation. Uh, uh, but I think I think they're all they're all great in different ways. And do you have um a, um a favourite Bond girl, or would that be Grace Jones, as you as you just mentioned? Um, I think I have to. I mean, I've read um you know Mark O'Connell's book. Mm. Uh, you know his wonderful his wonderful fan book. Um, yes, yeah. And I'm kind of with him on Maud Adams. I think Maud Adams is really classy she, she can really act and she brings kind of a, a bit of dignity to the role of the bond sort of squeeze yeah. in the way that which is possibly something that some of the other films could do with a little bit more 
and I love Octopussy. It's got the best soundtrack. Uh, yeah. Great film, and I think she's terrific in it. I, that's that's a man after my own heart. Octopussy is definitely one of my faves. Uh, and also, I think her and Roger always had great chemistry on screen. Um, so they obviously got yeah, on that. definitely, yeah. Um, okay, so on to question number five. What is your earliest memory of Bond? Well, I had a, uh, I had a rather strange childhood because my parents... Uh, my dad worked for Shell and was always being posted all over the all over the world. So I was born in Salvador and I lived in Barbados in Norway and um, and I went to boarding school when I was eight um, and rather well, like Fleming and like Fleming I hated it. It was horrible. It was a really old fashioned English boarding school. Um, and one of the rules was there was no TV allowed apart from on Saturday nights you were allowed to sit down and watch a video. You know, it was a VCR in those days. Yeah. But the school only had two films. And so we would just watch one one week and one the next. Um, and one of them was um, Where Eagles Dare, you know, Broadsword Cup Calling Danny Boy. You know, Fantastic Richard Burns stumbling film. around in his terribly drunk way. Uh, yeah. And the other one was Live and Let Die. Oh. Um, so I watched Live and Let Die every other weekend. And as an eight-year-old boy, mainly it was just incredibly sexy. That's right, so. Yeah. Uh, and exciting. Um, and looking at the film now, it's... It's, it's, it's a period piece. It's hilarious. You know, all the black exploitation stuff. I mean, amazing. <laughs> yeah. But it's still a good film. It's still a good film. Um, and that was my, not my first, exp- it wasn't just my first exposure. It was my first, second, third, fourth, fifth, <laughs> up to about a hundredth exposure to Bond. Wow. Well, I saw, saw another single film. I've seen that one a hundred times. Well, if you were going to have any two films that you had to watch back to back, Where Eagles Dare in a Bond film is not bad going. <laughs> It's not fair. No. And funnily enough, I think Live Let Die is pretty much one of Tom's favourites as well. Um, it's definitely his favourite Roger, and I think it's one of his favourite Bonds overall as well. Well, it was, it was, of course, it was the first Roger, and it was also, like Dr. No, it was filmed in Jamaica. Mm. Um, all the, and I've beat all of the locations where it was shot, and, um, and in, in some places it was shot in the same places as Dr. No was shot. There's mm. several, several hotels that feature in both of those films. Um, and I don't know if you've read Roger's book about going to Jamaica and doing the filming of Live and Let Die. It's really, it's really great, really funny and interesting about Jamaica. Yeah, and he, of course, went and visited. They all, they all did this. Um, I met this woman in Jamaica who was an extra in, in, in the film. And she was after the, after the shoot. They were, she was hanging around with the cameraman. And, and they said, so where's this place, Goldeneye? You know, and she said, oh, it's just up the road. We'll go. So they all piled into a car and they went up to Goldeneye, yeah. which at that stage was empty. No one was living there. Um, but they got in and they had a look around. They were going, wow, this is where it all, this is where it all happened. This is where, you know, the first book was written. All the books were written. Mm-hmm. And Roger went as well. And there's pictures of him with um, Violet Cummings, who was, who was Fleming's housekeeper for the entire time he was yeah. in Jamaica. Wow. Um, standing there, safari suit and everything. So brilliant. And he, he said, I spoke to him and he said, I was just in a sense, I had a sense of awe that I was in this sort of place where so much, so much had been created by Fleming. I mean, the, the creativity flowing in that house was quite something. Mm. That's, that must have been quite an experience. And I always thought, it's, it's strange, some of the films for me tend to parallel one another. You have like Diamonds Are Forever and Die Another Day with the Diamond Satellites are quite similar. You have... There's there's quite parallels between Goldfinger and A View to a Kill. If you look at the story, uh, they're quite similar um, in, in a way. And obviously, Doctor No and Live Let Die have that as well. There's a lot of familiarity and flow between those two films. Both obviously their first film, both set in Jamaica, and yeah, it's it's an interesting sort of thing, I think. Yeah, and of course, they both both the Jamaican set ones have this off, offshore islands, you know, Island Island Surprise or Crab Key. Yeah. Um, which I think is so interesting because the first time that Fleming went to Jamaica was in 1943, it was during the war, and he was sent out there to participate in an Anglo... Uh, probably yeah, you, all your listeners know all this, um, but he went out there for this anti-U-boats conference because U-boats were causing a lot of a lot of um, shipping to go down in the Caribbean, and it was an important um, strategic part of the world. Um, and one of the things, one of the rumours that was flowing around at that time um, and the Caribbean is full of these larger-than-life stories. I mean, that's something else that feeds into Bond and so, you know, fantastic all things. But one of the stories was there was this Swedish guy who was a friend, supposedly a friend of Hermann Goering's, who owned a 
um, a sort of paradise island just off the Bahamas. And the rumours were that he had converted this into a secret U-boat sort of base. Wow. Um, which is just so so bon, you know. I mean, it turned out to be completely untrue, <laughs> but you can see where that idea came from. Came yeah. from. So, um, wow, intriguing story, that one. Um, okay, so on to question six. Now, if you had a choice to visit any Bond's location that you haven't visited before, what location would you go for? Okay, well, I've, I've obviously covered the Caribbean where he spends a lot of time. It would probably be the man with the golden gun, the which is... Thailand or China, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, in Thailand, that one. Formations and, um, yeah, that, that, I, I, fancy, I fancy that part of the world. That looks pretty, pretty lush. Uh, I see you're a man that's after uh, sunshine and sand and exotic places. Yeah, yes, I suppose. Yeah, I'd be interesting to I'm pra- I've never been to Prague. Isn't there that's something that happens in Prague, I'm sure? Is that... Um, there's in the Living Daylights, yeah. there's a bit in Prague. Yeah, that's great. yeah. That, that looks that looks like that, that. That has this lovely Cold War feel yeah. as well. A sort of almost Le Carre-ish sort of Cold War feel about yeah, it, which you obviously don't get in on the beach. No, very Eastern European, old spy, sort of Soviet bloc type feel. Uh, so for question seven, this is the last of the quick fire rounds. Now this is a, it's a bit of a strange question, but okay. what what would you say is the most Bondian thing you've ever done? <laughs> Um, we drank, drank too much, smoked too much. Is, yeah, that's probably that's that's right up there, definitely. Okay, so that's the end of the uh, quick fire round. So now we're on to the main questions. Um, so obviously, um, I read up a little bit about your sort of uh, childhood and your background, um, growing up in sort of Central America and the Caribbean. Can you tell us a bit about that? Um, yeah, it was uh, being in the Caribbean. I, when I, in Central America, I, I left when I, you know, was sort of three or four or something. So I don't really remember that. But, um, but I was in Barbados during the 1980s when I was a teenager. When I, I think I was 13 when we first went out there. We stayed there for about five years, um, and it was just really. It, it just got me so interested in the in, in the place because you spend the first first few holidays you. you you lie on the beach, you do the windsurfing and all that kind of stuff, all the tourist stuff. And then after a while, amazingly, that actually gets quite boring. And you start looking around. And Barbados, which is 20 miles by 10 miles, has nearly 300,000 people living on it. Mm. And you look around and just go, this is a really, really strange place. You know, no one, there was, there was no original inhabitants of Barbados. When the English turned up in 1627, it was an empty island. It was this clean slate wow. and now it has 300,000 people living on it how did that happen what are all these people doing there yeah. and that got me very interested in the, the in Caribbean history um, which is of course this story of sort of piracy and entrepreneurs going into sort of these incredibly rich sugar barons mm. um, and really the, the, the money from the Caribbean these tiny little specks in the ocean basically made Britain what it is today. It funded the Industrial Revolution. It created Bristol, Liverpool, much of London, insurance business, banking, all through sugar and slaves. Um, and it's just they just seem to be such incredibly important places in British history. Uh, and Jamaica, of course, as well, um, is the same, but on a much bigger scale. And if you go to Jamaica today, and Fleming picked this up as well, you know, the history is... It, it's very contested, yeah. and it's very dark, and it still throws a really big shadow over the whole place, what happened there under under British. There's so much history. Like it, Even then, when you said uh, Barbados was uninhabited until like the 1600s, I wasn't aware of that. So that that's that's quite amazing in itself, really. Yeah, well, it's the Robinson Crusoe. It's the Robinson Crusoe story. You turn up, and it's uh, or maybe Robinson Crusoe or... Um, you know, Lord of the Flies. It's this sort of empty space, and you know what we made of it. And of course, what the English made of it was hell on earth. Yeah. So if you've got the money, it, it's the best place to be. Um, if you haven't, then it's the worst. And, and Jamaica's like that as well. Um. So what sort of interested you? Um. That drew you to Golden Eye itself. Was it the the history of the area? Was it about Fleming? Was it to do with the location itself? 
Um, or was it because Bond was a part of the story, or was it a combination of all of the above? I think it's. I think uh, when I was in when I was in Jamaica researching a previous book, I, I sort of scolded and came. I didn't know at that point that it was so important in Fleming's life that uh, you know that house was central. What he got married there, he wrote all the books there. He was happy there in the way that he just wasn't in in England. I mean, several of his friends say, you know, in in Jamaica, the, you know, the rough edges come off and he's as much of himself as he ever can be. I mean, that's a quote that someone said about him. Yeah. Um, and then then a little bit later, I was watching, like everyone else, the, the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games. And there, of course, the show is completely stolen by the Queen and James Bond. And, you know, he's walking down and you see the back of the Queen's head and you think, here's Helen Mirren, she's doing the <laughs> Helen Mirren, she's doing the shtick again. And then it's actually, you know, per badge. Yeah. I mean, it's just amazing. This is uh, this is the apotheosis of Bond. This is the moment he becomes Longwee, who another incredibly anachronistic figure from modern Britain, yeah. you know, just like Bond is. Uh, and you kind of think, well, this is really important. You know, how come this person created in the 1950s in Jamaica is today our national icon. You know, what else do we have from the 50s? We don't have music, we don't have fashion or art, we don't have the attitudes to women, sexuality, all those things have been discarded. But yeah. we kept bond. Yeah. Why? And, you know, what does this say about us yeah. as a nation? And then if you look at, I mean, what I wanted to do, I wanted to look at bond from the point of view of where and when it was written. Yeah. You know, the background of what's happening in Jamaica. Um, and the minute you do this, all of these things just pop out at you when you reread the books from this point of view. I mean, one small thing, pirates. Mm. Pirates just appear again and again. In fact, here's a trivia question for you. Okay. How, many, how many James Bond novels and stories mention pirates? Right, that's an interesting okay. question. Like, obviously, we, we mentioned Live and Let Die earlier, and, and I remember the whole pirates and, and the gold coins and, and everything like that. So that's obviously one. Well, from, Let Die, it's central to the plot, isn't it? Yes, exactly, yeah. Um, from from the way that you phrase a question, I can imagine quite a few of them probably have used pirates, but off the top of my head, I'm not sure. So so y- you tell me. Okay, well, Let Die, yes. Doctor No? I can imagine, uh, yeah. Where we, we hear that Quarrel is descended from pirate stock. That's right. Um, it's not, and it's, it's usually being in association with a pirate is a very good thing. Mm. I mean, Fleming himself was described as having a piratical air. Mm. Uh, and he gives this to James Bond as well in Casino Royale. He's described as looking a bit piratical. Mm. Um, and then Thunderball, obviously, you've got, you know, Emilio Largo's cover for what he's doing for Blofeld is that he's pretending to be searching for the lost treasure from pirates. Um, Her Majesty's Secret Service, Tracy describes Bond as looking a bit like a pirate. Wow. Um, Ris- Risico short story. Um, the the good villain I can't remember his name. Um, mm. uh, the good villain in that is yeah. described as as being a, a, a lovable pirate, mm. as is Kareem in um, from Russia with Love. Yeah. Uh, so and usually it's a good thing. And the one occasion where it's a bad thing is when Goldfinger, which is the, probably the least Caribbean of all the books, mm. that he is described his action of, um, of taking on Fort Knox is described as being like. Henry Morgan, the pirates, attacking Panama City. Wow, okay. They have so seven novels and one short story mentioned pirates. That, that, is, that is amazing. That, that's, that's, that is intriguing because off, off sort of the cuff, I wouldn't have even considered that, that many books contain sort of about pirates. You know, that's interesting to see because obviously Fleming had that on his mind then and it's something he which loved, he thought... He loved pirates. They were sort of, you know, they were resilient, they were resourceful, they were energetic. They were kind of get up and go, which is what he was so disliked about post-war Britain that the feather-bedded youth were sort of, you know, scrounging off the welfare state and we should all have this. In fact, David Cameron, our Prime Minister, said the other day that we should have more of this sort of... Um, but the buccaneer spirit. We should, as a as a nation, we should be more buccaneering, you know. Yeah. And it's the same. It's the same thing. Yeah. But it's not just. I mean, that's that's a small thing. But if you look at the the ingredients that Fleming threw together in that room at Goldeneye to make Bond, I mean, there's you know the high the, the sort of jet set high end touristic world that he moves in. I mean, at the time in fifties, Jamaica was the the most glamorous place that you could go. Marilyn Monroe was there. Mm. Errol Flynn was there. All of the, uh, you know, you weren't a proper Hollywood star until you were photographed in, in, in on the Jamaica's North Coast, this Gold Coast. Um, what else? We have the the concern with the with decline 
imperial decline that runs really strongly through the books, particularly the later books. Yeah. And there's there's Fleming, and, and Jamaica's a microcosm of that because Jamaica, from forty six to sixty four, goes from being a complete imperial backwater, a sort of throwback to the sort of high imperial Victorian times, through by sixty two independence. So there's this massive change happening in Jamaica, and that's reflected in the books as well. Um, the concern with race, you know, we all know, having read the books, that Fleming is obsessed with race and mixed race yeah. people. Uh, and, I mean, that was that's obviously a massive issue in Jamaica at the time, and still is. Um, the, the other thing that, that you really pick up from looking at um, Fleming's letters and journeys and, and the books is how much he hated the United States. He hated America. He thought it was trashy and materialistic and I mean that's one of the pleasures of the Bond books for the English is this therapeutic anti-Americanism that yeah. runs through them um, and that's the, that same thing was happening in Jamaica he hated all these thrashed American millionaires coming out and you know buying up all the hotels and being vulgar and too loud and uh, this kind of thing um, and if you look at the if you look at Mr. Big he's an, he's part of America yeah. it's, it's you know he's a Russian spy okay but he's kind of an American um, and one of the things that the um, I can't remember who it is someone says to says to uh, possibly to Strangbit or to Bond. He says, "Well, you know, you've got to be careful about this Isle of Surprise because Mr. Big has got big protection in Washington. So even though he's supposedly a kind of Soviet spy, actually it's America that's causing the problem. Yeah. And even Doctor No, Doctor No, of course, you know, comes from made his money in New York gangsters yeah. and and so on. And he even speaks with a slight American accent. Doctor mm. No mentioned, mm. and his men." The Chigros call Bond limey in the American fashion. So he's mm. kind of American. So there's this anti Americanism yeah. that comes, that's also expanded from Jamaica. And then, of course, there's Cuba, the whole Cuba thing. So there's masses of Jamaica. All of, all of these roads lead back to Jamaica, mm. if you look at it from that point of view. And, and do you think that um, obviously all of that influenced Fleming and how he wrote and influenced the books and. and, and um, uh, obviously, on the character of Bond himself. Yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's this other thing about about Jamaica is that as a place, it's I think the, the spirit of the island, um, as well as the sort of the actual sort of geopolitics and stuff of the moment. But they they they're throughout the book. Jamaica Jamaica is a place of exaggeration, or it's got this wonderful tradition of sort of gothic grotesques in in songs and stories, and I mean, and that's that's what the Bond. The Bond villains are these sort of larger than life grotesques, um, and this sort of the, the horror. There's the slight air of the supernatural, which is only really in *Live and Let Die*, mm. um, and also this sort of melancholy. Um, that you know, the thing about Jamaica, sort of still today, and certainly in the fifties, is that it was a, a place. It was very obvious had seen better days. You know, everywhere there are these ruins of old plantation houses and mm. you know falling being recovered by the jungle and there's this very sort of romantic sort of you know image that Fle lots of writers as what well, Fleming and Fleming of course uses it for solitaire grows up in a ruined um, a, a ruined house and of course honey child rider as well mm. she's, she's you know lives in the basement yeah. uh, and actually when I was when I was out there um, I met a, a woman called Patrice Wymore mm. who's the widow of Errol Flynn we married Errol Flynn, and she was herself a Hollywood star uh, of some standing. Mm. And she married Errol Flynn uh, and went to live in Jamaica with him in, from 1950. And it was, it was kind of a bit of a disaster. I mean, at, at their wedding, he got served with a writ for underage sex. And, you know, it kind of uh, went. But she, she was, um, when I met her, she sadly died a, lot, a few months ago. She was 87. And she was just, she was a mess. She was pure Hollywood. You know, in the... Um, so I get the Christie films where you have that character who's the old actress, you know, rather sort of flamboyant with the scarf yeah. and the big hat and yeah. sort of big gesture. She was exactly, <laughs> exactly like that. And we met her, I was with my wife, and we, we were meeting her for brunch at a, at a bar on, on down near Port Antonio. Um, and she comes in about 11.30 uh, looking just amazing, orders of her first walker and tonic, lights up this cigarette. She smokes in a sort of you know, the most Hollywood way. Um, <laughs> but, but she she inherited, Errol Flynn died in 59. He kind of dragged himself to death. Yes, yeah. Rather like Fleming did. Um, and she inherited 2,000 acres in Jamaica of sort of, of farmland and coconut plantations. And she ran it until last year. Wow. Uh, and she lived in the house, and the house had its roof and top story blown off by a hurricane about 20 years ago. And she lived like 
one of these Bond heroines in the cellar, you know, with just some dogs and that was it. Amazing character. Wow. Um, but she told me how much Errol Flynn and Ian Fleming disliked each other. It, really? God, that's, that's an interesting one. Because they've got quite a lot in common in yeah. terms of sort of, you know, womanising and drinking. And, yeah. But I think it's part of Fleming's, he, he hated America. He, he hated Hollywood. I and mean, there's that line in... Um, from Russia with Love, when she says to says, says to him, uh, "Oh, you're just like a Hollywood. You look like a Hollywood film star." And Bond says, "That's the don't, don't, that's the worst thing you can say about someone." Yeah. So maybe you know, maybe that's why Ian and Errol didn't didn't see eye to eye. Didn't see eye to eye. Yeah, um, it's an interesting one that. So um, obviously, people are aware that Fleming went to Jamaica. When he spent his time there, he did his writing. You know, he, he did a lot of snorkeling. He did a lot of eating, drinking, and smoking. Um, so, what else would Fleming have done in his spare time? I'd imagine he was quite a social animal. Um, was there like a, a social party scene, and was he a part of that? Or yeah, I mean, it, it kind of it, it changed. He was, mm. There's no sort of fixed. There's no sort of fixed picture. When he first went out there in '46, he went out with his friend Ivor Bryce, who was mm. sort of disliked by the family, and he was considered a thoroughly sort of loose and bad influence. <laughs> and another guy, and they, they was basically a sort of bachelor party. Mm. Um, and in theory, he, this is when, by this stage, um, Ian is sort of going having an affair with Anne Anne mm. Rothermere, um, that he he married in '52. Mm. Um, but he was carrying on; they were carrying on all sorts of all sorts of. Um, uh, 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 sort of shenanigans and that was the year and this is actually 47 so it's not it's the second year he went out there and this was the year that this hotel opened called Sunset Lodge mm. and this was the moment where the jet set was launched on Jamaica right. um, and there were and after that every year there'd be new hotels like the Jamaica Inn yeah. and the um, Silver Sands and there was this sort of explosion and each all of these would have these huge parties on the beach every night and the big thing was dressing up it was costume parties so you go as a red indian and this kind of stuff yeah. and and clearly it was a kind of like a sort of happy valley scene you know the happy valley in kenya where you've got these these whites sort of bed hopping and, and yeah. drinking and taking drugs <laughs> um while in the background sort of black jamaicans are actually trying to get the vote and trying to get trade unions organized but there's this sort of bubble going on and he threw himself into that scene yeah. but he got quite bored with it quite quickly Really? Um, it's the same with Noel Coward because Noel mm. Coward built a house nearby to be right. Fleming. I'm sure yeah. everyone knows. Um, and eventually, they get tired of this sort of, you know, seeing the same people and the, having the same cocktails and the <laughs> same conversations. Um, and this is really when Fleming so he turns inwards. I mean, and this is when he actually prefers to spend his time at Goldeneye mm. writing James Bond novels. Yeah. He also. As well as the the reef, he loved the nature. He loved the hummingbirds, mm. the blue mountains, and he went off on expeditions up into the mountains. Um, and he he won expeditions down to the, the the Cayman Islands and looking for shells and that mm. and that sort of thing. Mm. Um, and they had a lot of guests out there. They had Evelyn War came to stay, mm. Lucy and Freud, who Ian also detested, um, <laughs> came to stay, and lots of other Graham Green. You know, it was a, a Rosamund Lehman. Mm. Um, so there was, a, there was a big sort of artistic scene as well mm. on the North Coast. There were a lot of painters and writers, huge homosexual community, mm. led by, of course, Powers and mm. Ivan Novello. Um, I mean, at one point, I think Anne, Anne wrote to Ian. Um, Ian had had um, Truman Capote came yeah. to stay at Golden Eye when Anne wasn't there. Yeah. Um, and Anne wrote to Ian saying, oh, you know, this is, this is, this is the last straw. Now, we were the only heterosexual household <laughs> 50 miles around, and now this is, this is, this is gone. <laughs> this is extraordinary when you think about Jamaican's attitude then and now to yeah. homosexuality. But if they have this, if the people who went to Jamaica and they felt that the usual rules didn't apply. Mm. It was that there was just this liberating feeling of being a long way from home and, you know, the sun and, you know, they just threw themselves into this, this sort of hedonistic yeah. um, life. Um, but Fleming, he, but he got, he got tired of it. And actually, you said that he drank and smoked a lot. Mm. And of course he did. Um, I mean, what they drank after their wedding, just unbelievable <laughs> in quantities. I mean, how they got up the next morning to sort of continue the rest of their lives, I do not know. <laughs> um, but he actually lived a health, much healthier life in Jamaica than he did in than he did in England. And one of the attractions for him, I mean, he called it, Coward called it Dr. Jamaica. Mm. Whenever I feel, instead of going to a therapist, I go to Jamaica. And there's this <laughs> mental refreshment from it that, that, that they got. Mm. And also physical, you know, he swam a lot. Mm. Um, and 
I don't think he drank as much as, I mean, I've, I've spoken to, um, you know, I've, I've read interviews with Violet Cummings, who was his, who was his, um, his, his sort of maid, a housekeeper. Yeah. And I interviewed his, um, Violet's um, niece, who was actually a minister in the Jamaican government, which was quite interesting. Um, and I think, it, he, you know, he'd have, a, he'd have a pretty dark scotch, you know, at about six o'clock, but he didn't drink with his meal. No. Um, and I think actually, um, and this is Blanche Blackwell, who is um, who is his Jamaican lover, yes, uh, yeah. and she is still alive. And mm. she was really the key interviewee for me to meet her. I just learned so much about Jamaica at that time and about Ian in Jamaica. Uh, she's now 101, still completely, you know, copper's mentis and full of energy. And, That's amazing. Uh, an amazing lady, incredible lady, and still sort of flirtatious and <laughs> fun, and, you know. And lively, um, and she said, she said to me, "Look, Jamaica, Jamaica. If he'd stayed in Jamaica with me, I could have kept him alive. Me and Jamaica, we could have kept him alive." Mm. Wow, and that, I, believe, I believe him. That's quite a statement, but you know, it sounds like it's it's almost sounds like this this sort of paradise place where anything goes. Um, people, people, you know, they can do what they want, but have fun and everything like that. And it, it's almost. Can can that ever be captured again? It's it was a time, you know, in the past now where you had this sort of little, like you mentioned, sort of a bubble, this outpost where where things could happen. And I don't know if that could happen nowadays. Obviously, you have people with their yachts where they can do whatever they like or what have you. But it's it's. I don't think anything like that could happen again. I mean, I think there was, there, it was a particular moment in time and place from mm. 1952 to 1964. Where you have all of these, all of these Jamaican factors, um, leaning on Ian Fleming, and, and from earlier, soaking mm. into him with its all the spirit of Jamaica, mm. soaking into it, and at the same time, you've got so much change happening in mm. terms of, um, you know, the black people coming up and taking charge, you know, and the the empire changing, and all of that's reflected. And I think that without this unique time and place, I don't think Bond could. It would either be very different. Or it wouldn't have existed at all, but mm. it wouldn't have been the bond that is such a sort of mega, mega you know, important part of our mm. of, of British identity or Scottish identity. Whether you're yeah, Scottish yeah. Or well, that, that's what I was th- I was thinking the other day that if Fleming had either not gone to Jamaica at all, or even if he decided to go uh, India. To, to spend his you know time writing Bond, or you know he could have gone to any place. If he had chosen somewhere else or didn't go at all and stayed in the UK, there's a huge chance that A, Bond wouldn't have been created or the books wouldn't have been as good. But the amount of um, information that was from Jamaica, from that area, is huge throughout, obviously, the books and the character. But it, 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 had, it had to happen. He, I think without that, well, Bond just wouldn't have been here, I don't think, or, or like you said, it would have been just vastly different, and perhaps it wouldn't have had everything that the world has come to love about Bond, really. Yeah, I mean, I think what, what, one of the things that really—I mean, I'm, I'm a historian, you know, that's where that's where I where I come from. I'm a historian, mm. of the way. and one of the things that you know, for any popular historian, is really interesting is is our relationship with history now. So, how mm. do we now feel about you know the Second World War, or how do we feel about? Um, the empire and slavery and so mm. on. Um, and one of the things that I think is that, that J- Jamaica brings to, to Bond is when, when, when Fleming went out there, it was a sort of reassuringly old fashioned place where mm. the imperial values, I mean, the, the sort of the, the deference shown to anyone white by black people was astonishing. Mm. Um, and I mean, it's still slightly the case. They still love the queen and this kind of thing. Um, but there was this sort of, idealized version of, of what a colony should be. And if you look at the quarrel character, it's the mm. perfect colonial relationship. Authority is just taken for granted. Mm. Um, and, so, and, and but really filming a version of history and of empire that is that you can challenge that mm. uh, you know a black Jamaican would look at Jamaican history very differently to how Fleming saw it. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's the same with with the books. I mean, Bond is this imperial hero. He's this he's this sort of reassuring fantasy that gives us to believe that Britain is still sort of you know up there and Britain's still on top and bestrides the world and this sort of thing. Yeah. Um, 
but we kind of we have that fancy but at the same time we know it's not true yeah. I mean, if, one of the things that, that also if you look at Dr. No filmed in Jamaica mm. um, in at least 62 um, it opens of course with um, you know the three blind beggars they're coming they're walking from, from Kingston yeah. to New Kingston where the Queen's Club the Ligony you know outpost of colonial the centre of colonial power is yeah. uh, but, but for some reason that is, that is never. I check, I check the route they take, and they go in the completely the wrong direction. And the first time they do, they walk across what was then Victoria Square, the first train, and there in the background is the statue of Queen Victoria. Okay. And then instead of heading north, yeah. they head south, and they walk past a statue of a colonial governor. Yeah. There's a governor in the 1840s. And they think, hold on, this country is about to become independent, and we're on a tour of kind of colonial statues. Yeah. And of course, the rest of the film, it's even less subtle. You know, yeah. you've got. Um, you know the soldier, the, the guy, Playboy Smith in khaki raj style shorts, yeah. and you've got the guards, and you've got the only time you see Jamaicans is there where these sort of picturesque fat ladies with bundles on their heads and donkeys, and yeah. you know, and, and the film comes out, to, you know, after the Jamaican independence. And if you mm. look at it now, you would have no idea that the Jamaica portrayed mm. is about to become independent. Um, and I think that you know, even even in that one, there is a sort of interesting interplay between the presentation of of empire and British history mm. and what the audience actually really know. Yeah. And, and, and this is done really well. And my favourite moment, you did, I was hoping this would be one of your ten or seven <laughs> questions, but my all-time favourite moment in any film is from um, no, Roger Moore, 1977, yeah. The Spy Who Loved Me. Yeah. I think it's the opening sequence. He's skiing. He's in this sort of outrageous <laughs> yellow onesie. Yeah. Um, and He's being pursued by, like, he's hopelessly outnumbered. And then we see he's skiing, he's skiing. Like, and then we see there's this huge sort of drop that he's about to hit. And we go, no, no, no. And he's, you know, he's nearly there. He's nearly there. And shoo, off he goes, flying off the edge. Yeah, and the music stops, there's silence. And he tumbles down. And then suddenly, boom, out comes the parachute. And it's the music comes roaring back. And the parachute is a Union Jack. Mm. And it's just, it's one of just the most, you know, it's, Celebratory, um, but it's self-aware, and you know we know that this is ridiculous and yeah. silly, you yeah. know, and, and we, when we're laughing at our own sort of enjoyment of it, and I mean I think Americans say this is one of the great moments of British humour, yeah. self-deprecating, and it's kind of our relationship with our past. You know, we're kind of proud of our past, but we're also a bit, it's a bit awkward yeah. and it's slightly shaped, you know, and all of those things and self-awareness that is such an important part of the bond films and Bond books. You know, the Bond mm. books are constantly sort of, you know, he's constantly giving a knowing glance to the reader and saying, look, come on, this is all pretty silly stuff. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's such an important part of Bond and an important part of British humour. And that's why I think we've really taken Bond to our hearts, mm. not just because he's this fantastic hero, but he's this slightly tongue-in-cheek yeah. character as well. And, and, yeah, no, without a doubt, I think I think that's that's absolutely spot on. Um, for, for, you know, having this figure who is the epitome of everything, and obviously for Britain, and but knowing that it, you know the actual country is nowhere near to the level that that this character is portraying, but yeah, you've got to go with it, haven't you? It's fun. It's it's uh, it's definitely a big part of it, I think. Um, but you, um, that's actually good with the quick fire round I think we might have to add an extra question now about what is your favourite scene from all Bond film but uh, we've got yours now so that's great um, one thing I, what, yeah, uh, one thing I was going to ask which is quite an interesting question is so once Do- uh, Doctor No was released what were the opinions of the local Jamaicans on the film if they went to see it Okay, because um, I've looked at the, um, I, I've interviewed a lot of people in, 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 in Jamaica for the book, obviously, mm. um, and the, there was, a, there was a, 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 the Gleaner, which is the national newspaper of Jamaica, mm. took, was sent along a reporter, the filming started, and the first scene was the coming out of the airport mm. with, the, with Marguerite Loire doing the, trying to take the picture, yeah. um, and they went along and they watched this, and they were going, this, this looks like an absolute stinker, yeah. you know, the, the dialogue is diabolical, and there was some extra... You know, it was, it was incredibly hot, yeah. and there was some extra was supposed to be carrying a, co- a suitcase or a coat, and then it, you know he's carrying it, and then he's not carrying it, and it's mm. all you know the continuity is all over the place. Yeah. Um, and it was, I mean, it was it was made on the cheap. Mm. It was made for you know only a million dollars, 
Um, you know, in between takes on the beach, it was Cubby Broccoli who was raking the sand to get rid of the, the footprint. <laughs> um, and and then, then they went to the Ferry Inn, which is where they kind of hang out, where Chris Blackwell, who was obviously worked on the film, and he, yeah. he, was, he was there, and there's photos of them there. And they went to interview a couple of these extras, and they're going, we just got paid so little money, mm. and, you know, this is, this is pretty... It's sort of cheap and nasty. Mm. But then they started just employing more and more Jamaicans. You know, Chris Blackwell got all his musician friends' jobs, carrying, you know, as, the, as music, obviously musicians and, yeah. and, and as sort of gophers and stuff. And there were, I think, 17 Jamaican a- actors appear in the film, okay. um, a lo- lot of whom aren't actually actors at all. I mean, one of the, one of the three blind men was um, Strangway's dentist. <laughs> um, I think the one who actually killed him was his dentist. It's <laughs> quite, quite suitable. Um, and so, and, and then, and then the film comes out, and it's such a huge hit, mm-hmm. and it's, and you know, and it's a good advert for Jamaica. It puts mm-hmm. Jamaica on the map. Mm-hmm. Um, and Fleming, of course, takes all the credit for this. He's in yeah. the Glee and says, "Yeah, I got all, I got all the jobs for, for Jamaicans." <laughs> and, and, and the Gleaner describes him as a sort of one man, you know, one man Jamaican industry. You know, <laughs> and they loved it, and he, he, you know, loved the appreciation of the Jamaicans as well. Yeah. Um, so it became, you know, it became iconic. And uh, you know a, a vision of Jamaica, and some people didn't like the way Jamaica was portrayed. Uh, just like people in Jamaica didn't like the the way that black people were portrayed, like the Quarrel character, yeah. pretty controversial. Uh, but on the whole, they thought Fleming was really good news for Jamaica. Okay, so there were one or two things they weren't sure about, but overall, obviously, it was it was better that the film was there and and bringing people there, bringing money in, and and yeah. and. Yeah, like I that. mean it's the same with it's the same with um, the, the, the whole question because the, to- the, the story of tourism in Jamaica. It's about, I mean, tourism in, is always interesting in a in a very poor country where you have mm. rich people, particularly when you've got the whole racial. You've got white people being served by black people, mm. you know, and it's all a bit kind of neo plantational. Um, and I interviewed a lot of people around Oric Best, and I said, "What do you think of Fleming coming?" And uh, and they said, "Well, the first time he came, he thought, you know, what's this white guy doing here?" And you mm. know, but then he started giving lots of people jobs. You know, he had the staff. The six maybe mm. you know constantly um and then violet bless her she she was you know when he wasn't there the 10 months a year he wasn't there unless he had friends because quite a few he lent the place to quite a few friends yeah. um she basically used it as her own and her big her big thing was um taking people down to the golden eye beach who were sort of revivalist church goers and they'd be baptized by being sort of plunged into the waters of, of which is <laughs> very unbond like somehow yeah uh, and, and i think he he made a real effort to to sort of get on with local people, mm. um, to treat his staff well. I mean, he didn't really, apart from maybe Barrington Roper, who mm. who was became a good friend. He didn't really have black Jamaican friends, mm. but he was unusually for a white expatriate. He was unusually courteous, warm, and open to to local Jamaicans. To, he liked Jamaican music. He liked Jamaican mm. food. Even some stuff that was pretty. Strange, mm. you know, it's got a bit shaky. I don't know if you've had that. It's, <laughs> it's not that nice. But he was saying, I'm only going to eat Jamaican food, mm. I'm only going to listen to Jamaican music. Um, he threw himself into it in a, in a very commendable way. Mm. But at the same time, he kept he kept a pistol at Golden Eye to, as he put, to warn off the black and as he put it. So there's, there's always two sides. Yeah, definitely. But it is nice, it is nice to hear that he did have that sort of nice mannerism you know and, and was quite warm to the locals because i can imagine back then there must have been some characters who were completely straight down the line and almost uh didn't want any contact perhaps or you know so it is nice to hear that fleming was yeah. one of the good guys was, you know i think you, you said earlier that you know oh, you know he was must have been very sociable in Jamaica, but mm. actually fleming wasn't a very sociable person it was mm. his wife Anne, was mm. this society hostess par excellence um and she would always want lots of people around. And playing like being on his own, that was one of the attractions for Jamaica, was that being, uh, you know, peaceful um, and not being loud and ostentatious. And mm. Jamaicans respected that as well, I think. Mm. That's great. That's really good. Well, um, for, obviously, we haven't had a chance to read through the book properly yet, as it's yet to be released. But we did have a chance to have a look at the cover. Now, both Tom and I have said that we absolutely love the cover, that it's it's it's... It, it captures the feeling of Fleming so well, Goldeneye. You see, basically, there's 
Fleming, he's at his desk, he's at his writing desk, he's leaning back. You can tell he's so, he's just really content and happy. You've got a lovely little window next to him that goes out into the beach and the sea, and it just looks so. He, his, uh, t- his typewriter's that his typewriter's there on his desk. He's sitting back, having enjoying a cigarette right next to the window where the beach is outside. Now, did you did you have a say in that cover? Um, did you have an idea? Oh, I was I was really worried that that cover would annoy sort of you know Bond proper fans for two reasons. First of all, the, the photograph, which is by Cecil Beaton, was taken in London. Okay. Uh, he obviously didn't wear a bow tie in Jamaica. No. He did it. Um, <laughs> and he also, the other thing which I thought would upset the purists, and I'm really glad that it doesn't, is that he had a strict writing regime in mm. which he would always shut the shutters. Yeah. So that he wouldn't be distracted by the birds and the, the sound of the sea and so on. Yeah. So it's horribly inaccurate if you want to be a sort of purist. But I think you're right that they've done a really good job yeah. of showing that he almost looks like he's just thought up a brilliant scene. Exactly. You know, by by soaking into it, he suddenly thought, "Yes, now this is going to be there's going to be a you know a dagger in a shoe, yeah. or there's going to be you know, whatever an octopus that yeah. grabs grabs Bond's leg, or you know." Yeah. Um, and uh, I hope it's I hope it's going to appeal to to the, the fans, and I hope that there's going to be some new stuff in the book that they that they won't come across anywhere else. Yeah, I think that that will definitely be the case, and and I I know what you mean about he he usually wrote with the shutters closed and everything, but it could be that he's just finished, you know, he's opened the windows, he's having a relaxing cigarette, and then he's got his thought. So you know that could work. It, it, it could be okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll use that if I get if I get harangued by a fan. <laughs> I'm going to say Chris says this. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, obviously, Gold and I, you've you've been there. Um, have you have you, have you like how have you been there often? Have you been there since? What do you think of the fact that it's now the big luxurious resort where everyone can go? Did, did you ever visit it before it became that, or, or you know, how many times have you been? There? Um, Chris Blackwell bought he bought it in the in the seventies, um, mm. and it, it didn't really. It was kind of, but it was only in the last maybe. Um, Five, five or six years that it's been developed. I mean, he lent the house to people, um, mm. and it's been developed. And then around it, they've sort of created a new beach, and they've mm. built these um, sort of little villas, which you can either buy or rent. Mm. Um, and it's 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 a lovely, lovely place. I mean, it's it's prohibitively expensive mm. yeah. um, to stay there. I mean, the sort of people who stay there, you stay there if you're Kate Moss, or if you're you know, Simon Fuller, or yeah. if you're, you know, um, Bill Clinton, yeah. you know all of these. It, that's the sort. Of, I mean, it's it's really a throwback to the, the, that 1950s Jamaica yeah. scene, where it's the sort of mega super rich who who, who stay there. Um, and the house is, of course, much more comfortable. Mm. I mean, there's hot water, for instance, yeah. which there hardly was in Fleming's time. Um, and um, they put a little pool. They put a swimming pool in, which Fleming would have been appalled by that because there's the sea just down the. You have to just go down the cliff, yeah. and get in the sea, um, <laughs> but you have to have a pool, otherwise you, you know, it's just a, it's something that you do. Yeah. Um, but it also, it also, Chris Blackwell, he also sort of hosts things there. There's a film festival there. Um, there's good. There's there's sort of writing. You know, there's sort of courses, and mm. you know, a bit. And he's a big supporter of the local. Scene. He's, there's a there's a project at the moment to try to get the reef, Fleming's beloved reef, mm. sort of back to how it was in Fleming's time. Because now, because of overfishing and pollution, it's it's pretty dead. You know, I've snorkeled there, and there's not much to be seen, sadly. That, that's but, a that's a real shame. Um, be- it really is be- because I, I like. I mean, I know that it's so expensive, and everyone. Uh, you know, you hold out hope that one day you might be able to end up going there, but you never know. But if you did, you, you'd want to get the full feeling. You'd want to wake up in the morning, uh, maybe have your scrambled eggs, um, go down to the beach. You want to go for your snorkel. You want to see what you imagine Fleming seeing. And if uh, oh, that is a real shame about the reef. So hopefully they can they can fix yeah, it up again. I mean, they've, 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 they've made it into a sort of reserve and they've got wardens guarding it to stop fishermen going in and mm. it's it's already showing massive results i mean mm. they're you know they're nature's pretty tough it's going to come back i mm. hope and i hope within within year, within a few years rather than than decades yeah but, but apart from that it's it's still there you can just imagine him you can imagine him sitting in the sunken garden mm. um 
leaning over the rail at the end, wallowing in the melancholy, which mm. is what he loved to do every night. He yeah. would just stare out the sea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and yeah, his his ghost is really strong there, mm. really strong. Uh, well, one day, I'm sure myself and Tom will will find ourselves here somehow, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> You'll enjoy it. Yeah, hopefully. Um, so, obviously, you mentioned um, when in your childhood earlier, you sort of grew up in, in the whole sort of uh, Central America sort of Caribbean area. Do you make a point of going back there to visit quite often? Well, yes. I mean, I've, I've written my last – my last three books have been have been about – the Caribbean, whether mm. it's the Panama Canal, whether it's the Sugar Barons, or where, and now and, and now this, mm. um, and and I, I do a lot of writing. I review about it, and I do radio stuff, um, and it's kind of my area of expertise, if you like, as a, mm. as a historian and as a sort of cultural social commentator or whatever. It sounds a bit pretentious. Yeah. Um, so the, basically, the more time I can spend in the Caribbean, the better. Mm. The problem is, it's you know. You know, if I was a one of these Tudor historians, I could just get on a train and go to Hampton Court, and yeah. it'd be pretty cheap and easy. <laughs> Going to Jamaica or Barbados or Antigua is yeah. you know, really expensive, yeah. and it's expensive to stay out there. You know, there's no kind of, and this is one of the problems of the Caribbean is there's no kind of B and B and B scene or no. backpacking scene. No. You know, it's just all really expensive. Yeah. So what I try to do is get invited to go and do a talk. Mm. You know, I've, I've done lots of lectures around there and then you get a bit of help, you know, they pay your expenses and then yeah. I can sneak in a bit of research yeah. um, at the same time. But it is a, it's a big investment, you know, mm. but it, the, the upside, of course, is that it's just the history of that region is just so rich, so fascinating, mm. and sort of shocking and gripping. Well, I, I find it. But, uh, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of stories to be told about the Caribbean. Great. Well, you mentioned, obviously, you, you've released a book. Uh, there was one called Hell's Gorge, which was about the Panama Canal and the Sugar Barons, which you mentioned. Obviously, now Goldeneye. Um, do you have any other books in the pipeline? And will they similarly be of a Central American Caribbean theme? And I have one book, which is which is I'm supposed to have finished quite soon, um, <laughs> by the end of the year, which is looking dr- looking terrible. So <laughs> no. I, should be getting, I should be getting on with this rather than talking about Goldman. But it's... <laughs> It's about a it's about a long forgotten English colony called Willoughby Land, which was set up in what is now Suriname okay. between 1650 and 1667. It lasted only 17, 17 years. Wow! Um, and no one knows about this place, hmm. but it was set up by um, cavaliers because during the Civil War, Barbados had declared for the king. Okay. So so um, Cromwell sent a fleet, hmm. and they they conquered Barbados. And they kicked out the Cavaliers, and they all went off to South America and set up their own pretty much independent colony uh, in this incredibly rich, you know, northern, you know, what's called the Wild Coast, yeah. um, with you know hardly anyone there, and these mountains and jungle, and of course El Dorado is mm. where Raleigh had gone looking for El Dorado, yeah. the city, the mythical city of gold. So they all went. So they all went, and they got other people in them to go and look for the city and set up. They set up this amazingly free colony. Um, but then the restoration happened, and you know, Charles, II, Charles II came back, yeah. um, and he was worried that this colony was too independent. So he started sending out spies to try and sort out. One of the spies was a woman called Afra Ben, okay. who is considered the the most the, the first woman ever to make a living writing in English. She was a playwright. Wow. Um, Virginia Woolf said that every feminist should put flowers on her grave to thank her. She's this amazingly important figure in, in literary history. Mm. But she before, but she was spying for Charles II, and one of the guys that she was spying on was the son of Cromwell's spymaster, um, who had called a guy called Thomas Scott, who had been killed because he signed the King's death warrant. And they were, he was a wanted man, so he fled to the jungles of Suriname. Afro Ben went out, out after him. They fell in love. <laughs> and then, so that didn't work out very well. No. And then he, and then he gets dumped by Afro Ben, and he goes to Holland and gives all the secrets of the defence of the colony. Here's the fort. Here's the shallow water to get to the, the deep water to get your cannons in yeah. to the Dutch. Wow. The Dutch conquer this colony um, in this very bloody battle, mm. and then the English reinvade and they get it back. But at that stage, peace has been signed with the Dutch in '67, mm. yeah. and the Dutch agree to. They say we'll keep Suriname. You can have New York. So that is how Britain inherited, got hold of the New York oh. colony from the Dutch. Wow. So it's a little; it's only a little story, yeah. but it's I, it, it, it's got spies and, it, and disease and 
Oh. Quite interesting, interesting from a historical point of view. Oh. I think. It also sounds fascinating from a cinematic point of view. I could see that being a film, like a, a great film, with all that sort of intrigue and spy and double crossing and everything like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll, uh, <laughs> next time I'm next time I'm pitching in Hollywood, I'll definitely give that a go. Yeah. The people are bombed. Yeah. Yeah. But that's it's it's like a Mata Hari, but actually a good spy as opposed to a bad one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely do. Um, okay, so um, we're we're coming towards the end now. Um, one of the questions that we tend to ask everyone is: if money wasn't an issue, you could make your own Bond film. You could choose who was going to direct it, who was going to play Bond, who would be your Bond girl, who would be the main villain, and what sort of location would you set it? Any ideas? Um. <clears throat> The location has to, it just has to be the Caribbean. It yeah. has to be the Caribbean. And for all the reasons I've been talking about, yeah. it's, that's where Bond, yeah. Bond lives. Or Suriname, perhaps. Or Suriname, or, <laughs> or, well, no, because that's too, that's too gritty. That's yeah. too gritty. Yeah. It doesn't work. I mean, Bond, he never goes to, apart from one little bit at the end of Dimes or Ever, he never goes to Africa. He never mm. goes to South, he doesn't go to places associated with poverty, mm. which is why I thought William Boyd sending him to Africa may have been a bit iffy. Mm. Um, so it's the Caribbean, it's uh, it's tricky, it's isn't it? Probably Timothy Dalton. Yeah, it's probably Timothy Dalton. Yeah, and obviously not when he's you know a few years ago. Yeah. Um. Uh. The Bond girl has it got to be a Bond girl who's appeared in a film, or could it be any any actress? A- any any actress at all, even actresses okay. nowadays. Yeah. Okay, I think Scarlett Johansson would probably mm. fit the bikini quite well. Yeah. Um, that's not too sort of sort of thing. So. She certainly would. Yeah. Uh, and the villain has to be a. I, one of the things I loved about Octopussy was um, Stephen Burkhoff, mm. just such a fantastic hammy villain. Yeah. He just really just laid it on thick, and that's yeah. great. Um, so there's got to be someone, someone like that. Maybe Anthony Hopkins or something could okay. get out his old. You know, <laughs> could be a good, could be a good Bond villain. He uh, he could definitely ham it up if he wanted. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, he probably would. And then. Um, then you could sort of maybe maybe a totally off the wall director like Peter Greenaway. I wonder what he would do with do with a Bond story. Wow, that's one uh, that's one that I haven't I heard. Think, I was thinking good. of the sexuality and the love of mm. music and food and all that stuff. Yeah. I think that could be that could be a really interesting Bond film. Wow, well, I like the sound of that. That's excellent. <laughs> Great stuff. Well, so for any of our listeners, whereabouts can they sort of find out about you online? Do you have your own website or Facebook or anything like I that? I do have a website, which is just matthewparker.co.uk. And um, the, the book is available from the 14th of August. And it should be, it should be in, in, in all the shops, I hope. And um, what is the full title? It's Goldeneye... Um, it's it's called Goldeneye, where Bond was born, Ian Fleming's Jamaica. Lovely. Sounds great. <laughs> I hope you get your copy soon, Chris. I hope you enjoy it. I think you will. I think you will, although I probably, uh, I don't know. I hope you will. I hope I'm, you will. I'm, I'm pretty sure I will. It sounds good. It's been great to sort of hear a bit of the history and, you know, obviously you've brought some information for people that you've interviewed and you've got a, a vast knowledge of the area yourself. So it's been great just to get a little snippet of that now. And then hopefully, you know, learn a bit more when I uh, go through the book later. Okay. Well, thanks very much for having me on, Chris. It's been really fun. No problem. Thanks for the interview. And, uh, yeah, thanks again. And hopefully see you soon. So, what a great interview. Some really, really interesting stories there. Yeah, he was, um, well, like we said, he, he talked quite a lot about how Jamaica was like this colonial output. And now, I mean, when he was saying it was like a sort of a heat, you know, an area for a headless activity where everyone just used to go and party and drink and Drugs and all sorts you know. of naughty shenanigans. Yeah, it sounds exactly. right up Fleming Street. No wonder it does. He, he moved there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So no, it's great, and obviously uh, hearing a bit about some of the other people and what they thought of Fleming as well. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot, lot of stuff. It's, it's made me definitely want to have a have a look through the book and sort of see what other sort of material was in there. I think definitely. So make sure wow. you go and uh, grab your copy. Uh, and uh, you go to Amazon and just type in Goldeneye Matthew Parker and you'll you'll see the book there. Um, sure. And it's always good to have Bond related material ranking high up in the in the bestseller lists and stuff like that. So if uh, make sure you go and get your copy this week and give them as much of a boost as we possibly can. Okay, so now it is time for my second favorite James Bond radio jingle. It's time <laughs> for Bond facts. 
That is a good so, one. So what have you got for me this week, Chris? All right, so Bond facts. I've got a couple of, well, this is a bit of a, a different sort of slant on it. I'm going to just say a few comments that I read about Fleming that he mentioned about Goldeneye in Jamaica. Okay. And then there's a couple of facts to follow. So um, this is Ian Fleming himself. So Goldeneye is a simple house which I designed, which was built by Jamaican workers. It has no glass in the windows, only the good old Jamaican jalousies, which are sort of the wooden slats. Um, it was designed so the birds can fly through and so we can live as much inside as outside. Oh, that's quite interesting. That's so beautiful. obviously when he writes, he, he has the shutters closed and, and, you know, that's his time. Yeah. But when out, they just open it up and let the birds come in and out. He's obviously a bird lover yeah. and, um, you know, but the, the birds of the West Indies and James Bond and all that, yeah. I need to get um, myself a Jamaican hideaway. That sounds great. I, we've got to do yeah. it. Definitely got to do it. Um, and another one, after visiting Jamaica... Uh, um, Obviously, he used Jamaica in a setting for quite a few of the Bond novels, which was uh, partly related to my trivia earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and Fleming said, I can't go on plugging Jamaica like this or my public will think I have shares in the Jamaican travel business. Because obviously he kept on referring back to it. Um, but this last one is quite good. Uh, he said, I wrote every one of the Bond thrillers here with the jalousies closed around me so that I would not be distracted by the birds and the flowers and the sunshine outside. Would these books have been born if I had not been living in the gorgeous vacuum of a Jamaican holiday? I doubt it. It is interesting, isn't it? Because I yeah. remember there was the famous thing about him one winter's morning in a January looking out at London and seeing it just pissing with rain, as it always yeah. does, yeah. And vowing that he would never spend another winter in England. <laughs> and I must admit, I feel... I, I get how he feels about that. Yeah. Definitely. If I could spend three months in Jamaica every year, yeah. you know, I wouldn't complain. No, no. Yeah, completely. <laughs> we'll so um, uh, my round of bomb facts is uh, obviously Goldeneye is now a, a, a resort. You can go and stay there. It's not just the one villa. It's, you know, uh, it's a whole kind of big resort. But When are we going again? Uh, I would love to, man. I, like, <laughs> If we can get some more listeners and we can we can wangle a free promotional trip to Goldeneye, I would be very happy. But uh, however, I don't know how likely that is. But um, yeah, so it's a full-on resort, but you have to be like uber rich to stay there. It's like thousands of dollars a night. I actually just went on the website to see just roughly to get to see how much it would cost to stay for a couple of nights. And every night I tried to put into the little booking system thing right up until August of next year it was just booked. So God knows how you even get. Is that for place. all the villas or just the main? I just Fleming looked at the Fleming villa because you know that's yeah, the one yeah. you're staying, isn't it? That's the one that you um, want, yeah. And that's what it's known as. Fleming Villa is like an island unto itself. Fleming Villa is all about privacy, your own beach, and of course your own pool, gardens, and staff. Walk off, walk over to Goldeneye for a spa treatment, for sunset cocktails at the Bezo Bar, and dinner at the gazebo. Really, it's the best of all worlds. If these worlds could talk, they'd tell us. They'd tell tales of artists and writers, spies and seducers. The romantic atmosphere is palpable. The vibe utterly relaxing. Though you may still find the inspiration lives here. Wow, Very that's nice. awesome. And I think you would. You'd get that feel if you were there, wouldn't you? You'd yeah. get that feel of Fleming and, and the surroundings. Yeah, and... yeah completely. And wow. when, when you stay at the Fleming Villa, you get your own dedicated full-time staff as well. So no wonder it really? costs so much, yeah. And then uh, yeah. Uh, my, my last Bond fact about the Golden Eye Resort is the master bedroom of Fleming Villa is known as Room 007, and it still features Fleming's original writing desk that he would have penned all the novels on. Man. That is awesome. That's something that is we've awesome. got to go there at some point. Yeah, like, you know. Yeah. We'll Even if we sneak in and break in, you know, just to. <laughs> well, I've come up with a plan. I, oh, seen really? As, seen as my uh, my little foray into James Bond cover songs of last week, um, yeah. I thought what we could do is do a James Bond tribute album, and you know, you can do some backing vocals, a bit of tambourine, yeah, and then we'll sell a few million copies, and then we can go. What do you reckon? Or we can get invited to the island. We'll perform. For people there, there. Go. there it is. Yeah, completely. <laughs> the number one Bond tribute band. Sorry, apart Warren Ringham. Apart from Cubie, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Move over. The duo of Tom and Chris have arrived. <laughs> <laughs> Me and my tambourine in the background. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Very nice. yeah. Um, yeah, there was only a couple of other little uh, facts I got as well. Um, so Chris Blackwell, and um, quite a few people might have known. Uh, he was uh, about 24 when uh, the Bond production team came to film Dr. No, and because he, he obviously grew up on the island, he was employed as the location manager. 
So to get that 24 is pretty decent. And now he obviously owns Island Records and you know, he found U2 and U2 Bob Marley, Marley and, and all that kind of sort of stuff. Thing. Yeah. Um, and his mother was a certain Blanche Blackwell, who was a very, very close friend of Ian Fleming's. Now, it depends on, on what you want to insinuate by that, but I assume <laughs> they were very close. Very close. Um, so, yeah. Which very is nice. Interesting as well. So, that's all, that's all that's for the um, facts for this week. Yep. So, now. So, now next we go round. to my very favourite jingle of James yep. Bond Radio, and it's time for the quote round. Okay, this is. Bon, 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 bon. James Bond. Very good. Um, and you know, and you know, um, Darren Legg, one of our listeners, actually mm. coupled together a small uh, section of all the bonds saying bomb, 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 bomb. You know, so we could use that or we could use mine or oh, we could so play we, both. We've actually got an official theme. We have. Oh, but Darren Legg, you're the man. Good work. He is. It's good work. So we'll play them both together. And obviously, you know, I don't think theirs will be quite as good as mine. But yeah. um, I mean, you see. can outbond Connery any time, oh, as yeah, far as I'm concerned. <laughs> bond, 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 James Bond. Yeah. Okay, so Mike, I gave the quote last week, which was good. Right on schedule. Ooh. No, I like that. Now, I happen to know, well, I happen to, to guarantee that you already know this one. So, go on then. Who was it? Well, it was the same person who I did my quote for <laughs> yeah. the time before. It was Max Zorin, uh, which is great. And that's a bit where um, he's, they're in the underground sort of cave thing and uh, he sort of checks his watch and the bomb is about to go to you know, right. exactly. flood, flood, flood the underground mine, well, which see, is good. I think we were both similarly inspired because with all the talk of, uh, of, of You to a Kill with Mark O'Connell. A that's what it ago, was, yeah. Like, that oh, must have been what a Zorin quote next time. And, and yeah. little did I know... Where, that your quote was a Zorin quote as well. So there we yeah. go. Okay, so my quote for uh, for this week is: <clears throat> "You might have even killed me if you'd taken off the safety catch." I know this, but I I can't put my finger on it right at this moment. You might have even killed me if you'd taken off the safety catch. Yes, I know. I've you got, got it? it. Yeah, I've got cool. it. I've got it. Nice one, good man. Very nice. Uh, and yeah, and hopefully next week if we can get a, another fan quote in as well, uh, that'd be great. Absolutely. So uh, we best answer our trivia questions of the day. Okay. So I'll ask my one again. Um, so which of the Ian Fleming James Bond novels was set in Jamaica? Okay. So you've got Doctor No. Yep. You've got Live and Let Die. Yep. You've got The Man with the Golden Gun. Yep. And I think that... There's one more that I can think of. There's one more that you can think of. Um, Casino Royale isn't... Uh, let me die. I'll give you a clue if you want it. Uh, I'm not sure I'll need it. Hold on. That's confidence right there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting a block on some of those middle books. Doesn't know from Russia with love. No. Uh... Oh, uh, uh, it's one of the short stories. Yes. Um, which... It's going to be um, Octopussy. Yes. Yeah. Well done. There Matt. it is. Excellent. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Brilliant stuff. And uh, my trivia question of the day is how many times during the entire Bond series does Bond actually say 007? Now, this one has got me stumped. Um, yeah, I really, I, I mean, I can hear him saying it, so I know it definitely happens. But um, how many? You you said there were a, a, one or two. There's two, two times? that I can think of. If okay. any listeners can think of any more, by all means, let me know. But I think it's he does it twice. Okay, um, I can hear sort of Sean Connery sort of saying it. <laughs> yes, you uh, can. Uh, Oh, I don't know. What what I'm going to do is spend the rest of this evening playing them all in my head, and then I'll come back next week and see if I can think of any. <laughs> but for now, I think I'll, I'll hand it over to you. To, okay. uh, so um, the first one is, and this is the one our listener Alexis uh, mentioned in his email, is in Thunderball when Bond punches Felix in the belly when he opens his hotel room door. Of course. And he says, sorry, Felix, but you're about to say double or seven. Yeah. Um, which was something we talked about, isn't it? Because why did yeah. that matter? I don't know. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And the other one is a very recent one. And if I tell you what it is, you're going to go, oh, of course. 
007 reporting for duty. Oh my goodness. Which is That's what amazing. Film? Reporting for duty, sir. Um, Skyfall, isn't it? Yeah, there yeah, it is. Of course, yeah. There we go. Is there no other? Right, I'll have I'll have a think then. I'll have a think and, and uh, like I say, I some of our listeners might completely blow me out of the water and find that you yeah. said more, but that's the only two yeah. that I can uh, I can think of. So next time we're going to be doing a bit of a double barrel episode, aren't we? In the sense, yeah. we're going to do a two parter because there's just so much to talk about. We would never be able to fit it into one episode. So we're going to be covering the scores of Bond. So this isn't the the theme songs. We're, we're leaving those to the side for a moment for a later episode. We're talking about the actual scores of the films uh, themselves. So the soundtrack, if you will. I'm a big fan of the Bond soundtrack. So obviously some, uh, some are just epic. Some... Yeah some of the cues i think this is this is good because you know the bond theme everyone knows the bond themes if you know everyone's got their opinions they love them or they don't the bond soundtracks sometimes don't get the credit they deserve yeah. in terms of there's certain musical cues which will bring you into the film you know you listen and suddenly you're there yeah. like i know we mentioned um, when we reviewed you only did it twice there's a couple of bits of music and suddenly you're in space yeah. because of these cues and it's magic that's one of them <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and john barry was obviously a master at that um but obviously there are others and uh, it would be great to go through so what we're going to do as the two parts are the first part we've um obviously with bomb 24 coming we're going to split it so we'll have the first 12 films so we're going to go from dr no to for your eyes only that will be our part one yeah. and then the podcast after that will do the the second sort of 12 from octopus through to skyfall cool sounds and good potentially Bond 24 if we can get any news between now yeah, and then. Indeed, that would be it. nice. It's going to be exciting times, man, because now the script is finished, everything's going full steam ahead. So yeah. we, we, with each passing week, we should hopefully get some more news. Definitely. Because um, it's, it's close, filming. Man. Is it still December or did they go I, back to October? I've, I've, I've read different things, but I've read yeah. the very end of November. Is very what, end of November what, now. What, okay. I, uh, what I heard. But, so it's August now. So, you know, that's, that's three months away, it's really. It's not far. It's not and far. I tell you what, if they do, I mean... I don't think they'll do, obviously they won't have London anywhere near as much as they had yeah. in Skyfall, but if there are some sort of on location filming in England, perhaps London or wherever, I think we need to uh, have a little background extra walk on. We need to get involved, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, I, I, I managed to make so it close, up. You so close, weren't you? Yeah, I managed to make it up for Skyfall when they were filming the scene uh, where Bond and, uh, sorry, where Em and Tanner are driving to MI6 just before it explodes along the bank of the Thames and I managed to find myself there randomly on the day and was walking along and, and witnessed that scene being filmed uh, and saw Em and Tanner and stuff. Um, sadly, Daniel wasn't anywhere to be seen. Um, but yeah, we we need to, It's our, now we're podcasters, man, it's our duty to get involved in that and and, and be on the, on on location nuisances yeah. to Sam. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say, yeah. even if we get kicked off, our <laughs> yeah. security asks them to again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it should be fun. There's going to be a lot of exciting stuff to talk about in the coming weeks and months, I'm sure. Look forward to it. So that's all for today. Uh, James Bond Radio will return with The Scores of Bond Part 1. I've been Tom Sears. I've been Chris Wright. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening, guys.